Lynn, how are you? Good to see you, Linda. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Morgan Harris. I'm with Acacia Consulting Group, and we work with Good Government Illinois to produce events like this one. Uh, tonight's virtual town hall is with State Senator Robert Peters and State Rep Kelly Cassidy. And of course, it is moderated by David Orr. So welcome to everyone in our Zoom room, and we're still getting some folks connected in. Uh, and welcome to everybody who's watching on Facebook Live tonight. In order to minimize background noise, only tonight's panelists and moderator will be unmuted. If you'd like to turn off your video cameras, you can do so in the toolbar below on your Zoom screen on the bottom right side, because again, we are streaming on Facebook Live. We have a number of questions from our audience already. Thank you so much for sending those in. And we're gonna to try to get to as many of them as possible tonight in the time we have. If you have a question during the event, please type it into the chat box and we'll do our best to get those answered as well. This event will stay up on our Facebook page and you'll also be able to find it on our webpage at www.goodgovernmentillinois.com. Good Government Illinois is a nonprofit organization and we depend on the generous support of our community and that's you. So if you are able, please consider chipping in so we can continue to bring you events like this. And you can again donate uh, online at www.goodgovernmentillinois.com. And now I will turn it over to David Orr. David. Uh, thank you very much, Morgan. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, uh, we were chatting. <laughs> a few of us uh, before the show. It's, it's kind of those movies, you like to see the outtakes. Uh, we have two characters among our guests tonight. So maybe we'll, we'll be able to get into that too. Interesting conversations about other than political things. So uh, we have two guests because we're focusing on the legislature. A lot of us don't follow too carefully. We're not necessarily there. We don't maybe understand all the issues that came down. So that's the purpose here. Uh, let me introduce the two, uh, two guests, we'll get right to it. Uh, we have a state rep, uh, Kelly Cassidy, uh, and we have a larger bios that you can see online, but here, just to tell you this much, you know, she was a legislative director for now, National Organization for Women, which gave her, you know, quite a bit of insights in a lot of issues, including how the legislature works. She also was in the state's attorney's office. Um, and just to highlight uh, a couple of areas where she's been in the forefront, certainly includes human rights uh, and family and medical leave. Uh, she's known to being a smart, tough, uh, speak her mind, doesn't shy away from battles, even had a few with the former Speaker of the House, a guy named Mike Madigan. Uh, she lives in Rogers Park, around the corner from me, uh, with, her th with her spouse and three sons. So welcome, Kelly. And we're well, um, glad to have Senator Robert Peters here tonight. Um, Robert's a really talented young guy, and uh, perhaps some of the hurdles he faced as a kid, which were pretty significant, including some health issues, uh, inspired him to this career of public service. Um, he became a political organizer where one of the things he did was fought successfully to require uh, Cook County judges uh, to basically set affordable bail limits. Those who follow that issue know a lot of people are particularly in Cook County jail because they can't afford the bail. Okay, he also now serves as chairman of the Public Safety Committee, and in, in some of the stuff we'll talk about tonight, he's been a, a pretty significant player in criminal justice reforms. Uh, so welcome, Robert. Um, okay, so let, let's just start with a general, maybe a little more political question. Um, has it made much difference uh, to you personally or to think your colleagues uh, that um, Speaker Madigan is no longer in charge, at least of the House? Uh, nice handoff there, Robert. Um, you know, both chambers were under new leadership. Uh, you know, we, we, we should have hung an under new management sign out in front of the Capitol. Um, and, and that there were there were great things and there were challenges related to it. Um, but ultimately, change is good. And, uh, you know, David, as you mentioned, you know, I, I was um, an early critic of Speaker Madigan and a big part of the group. We call ourselves the 19. Um, who, who ultimately um, held out until we got a new speaker. And, you know, what all of us were united in, we, none of us came to it from the same perspective, what, but what we were all united in was normalizing change. Um, you know, legislatures all over the country get new leadership on the regular. 
and what we were the outliers, you know, having having chamber leadership uh, in place for the better part of my lifetime. So it was different. Um, a lot of Madigan's um, senior staff stayed around, and I think that was a good thing. I think we needed that stability for the transition year. So I really think we're going to continue to see change. We're really going to get to see what kind of leader Speaker Welch is as he begins to get to build his own team. Um, and I'm excited to see what that looks like. Um, we joked uh, the other day that the biggest change was I, the, the sentence, I texted the speaker and he texted back. You know, we went with a we went from a guy who didn't have a cell phone to a guy who's pretty social media savvy and very tech savvy um, and very open and communicative as compared to a, a, a guy that, you know, his chief of staff used to have a sign on his desk that says no one gets to see the wizard, no one. Um, so that was probably the biggest change. Um, and, and ultimately it was a positive one. I think there were a lot of folks who, who were energized capacity to have an impact and i i'm i'm thrilled with the outcome good robert i mean i guess i could talk about uh the new senate president uh this was his first full session uh his sort of first non um covid specific session uh and i think the the main thing about president Harmon is the fact that he's not too heavy-handed right the idea is that he allows us all to come in he listens to us, um, you know, even if we have different ideas, uh, he allows us to have those debates and sort of figure out uh, where we're at as a caucus. Um, there were multiple times this year where, you know, whether there was a block of us who represented that more progressive block, uh, folks who were a little bit more conservative, we're all invited in the space to make a case about where we're at, where we stand. Uh, and he listened to us, he took our feedback, and we were able to sort of bring together a more coalition-based uh, model in terms of how we got things done uh, in the Senate. And so for me, it's, it's weird. It's one of those things where I thrive sort of in that organizational space. I do come from organizing. Uh, and I always find that to be a challenge because that means you have to have more and more conversations with people about what's going on. But I, I did appreciate the fact that there was this level of respect. And I, I think the other thing is that he made it very clear uh, particularly to us who are younger, uh, more folks of color, progressive, uh, how much he valued our opinion on matters. Uh, and I, I think that just, that's one part, I think, um, you know, generationally where he's at. And I think that's also uh, politically where he's at. And I think it's also astute to understand that he believes that we're able and capable to sort of self-organize as members about what we need to see in terms of, um, uh, of the Senate. Good. Robert, I love that point where like actually, and this is was very much a, a much bigger issue in the house, but like being treated like the grown-ups we are and and you know being granted that space. There was a, a lot of um, control released with the with both new leaders, I think, but in particular on on in my chamber. Well, okay, one of our uh, listeners' questions is from Sue Paston, and, and the question is this: uh, what steps have can, I, can be taken to ensure that minority ownership um, happens, uh, particularly in the cannabis industry. Um, Kelly, you had a lot to do with this. So what's the latest on that? Yeah, so, you know, the original bill, the original law was um, the first time anybody had tried to find a way past some of the constitutional challenges other, other states had faced. Um, and, and so it was, it, it was, we were trying, right? We were trying something new. Um, and the combination of some of the unintended consequences of what we tried to build and the pandemic hitting at the same time certainly created a situation that was untenable. Um, so we did pass a law or pass a bill and I believe the governor signed it, um, but, but we passed a bill to create some fixes. There will be multiple new lotteries from this same pool so that the a lot of the, the backlash um, and justifiable, you know, that first round of, of dispensary licenses resulted in only 21 entities getting access to the lottery for the 75 licenses. That's tied up in litigation. The, the bill that uh, Representative Ford passed that was the result of a better part of a year of negotiation I, that, I, that I participated in, I believe Robert, you were in some of the meetings along the way as well, but that, that you know, trying to find a path through 
that would get some new licenses out to the street and get them into the hands we intended them to get into. Um, and so there will be two more lotteries from that group as a result of this new law, as well as a lot of changes that are gonna just make access better, um, separate from licensing opportunities, but how do we make sure that patients have full access? How do we make sure that the businesses can actually operate within this space? So it's, it's a pretty broad spectrum change, but the biggest piece is these two new lotteries that the governor's office has said they hope to have by August, so that we will actually see new licenses on the street this year. Uh, something came up on the radio today, Kelly. Um, this is certainly good. The, um, there will be uh, greater minority participation, but there's no way to catch up, right? In other words, like uh, the, a lot of, you can't have them too close to each other. So a site, we're talking about one at like Wrigley, Wrigley Field area. So the challenge will be, um, is that we'll get hopefully new minority owners, but there's no way to catch them up to the kind of advantages the early folks got, is there? I mean, the reality is the, the market will mature and things will balance out, right? You know, as we look at states that have 10 years under their belt um, that didn't make these efforts, absolutely. But we are coming in at a time when our market is incredibly immature and relatively unlimited. Um, and yes, there's a lot of, of um, head start that the, that the other folks have, that is the result of the way the medical program was written that made it really hard for folks to get in. And so we have a lot of fixing to do. Um, but ultimately, you know, what we, what we came away with in our research is it takes about five years for a market to be fully mature. I frankly believe that the last year and a half is a blip that might not count towards that five years, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Um, the, the, the not having facilities too close together, um, the 1500 feet rule that you mentioned, um, really was the request of the Black Caucus at the beginning because they were aware of communities in Denver in particular, that was what was cited most often, that look a lot like you know, the, the neighborhoods here where you have a gold store, a liquor store, a sneaker store, a gold store, a liquor store, a sneaker store. They wanted to make sure we didn't have that kind of concentration and maybe 1500 feet was, was overkill. Um, but there is, a, there is a need to avoid that undue concentration. That might, might not have been the best way to do it. So I'm, I'm curious to see how this plays out. But you know, finding that balance is the challenge and nobody in the world has done it right yet. We're just trying to figure it out as we go. It, it's definitely a, a situation of building the plane as you fly. Okay. Um, you, you also, can... I just got to note that, that the governor has not signed Ford's bill yet, but I, I believe that he will. It was negotiated with the governor's office, so I don't see that he won't. On any of these things, feel free, either one of you to jump in or I'll just keep going on questions. Did you want to say anything on that, Robert? I mean, I don't, I don't have too much to say. I mean, my, look, I think that when I think about cannabis uh, and I think about almost anything, uh, whether it's the housing market, uh, when we're talking about, um, you know, tech, we're talking about education, I think that it's particularly hard for states to get something like this right when we have systemic racism. In, in, in all honesty, I, I, I come from a sort of a pessimistic view on equity when you do it state by state basis. Um, the, the way that capital flows, funding, investment mm -hmm. uh, is extremely systemically biased. And, you know, I think the, the bigger thing that I would say is a critique and the thing that I, I sort of stick on it that we put too much emphasis on the dispensary side when so much of the economy is based outside of the dispensary side of things and to me um this is just we've we turned the dispensary into the idea of winning a willy wonka ticket and i to me this is a this is a bigger broader systemic problem so and I think, to be honest with you, that makes me different than almost anybody in any caucus. I mean, even in, in the Black caucus, I think fundamentally the reality of the way that um, capital and incarceration and uh, these systemic institutional measures exist in this country, that if you think we're going to get this right on a state by state basis, I mean, I just it, I'm willing to take I'm willing to hedge that bet uh, any day. Um, and I think that if anything, this is a challenge for us that if we were to ever do it at the federal level, which I'm, I'm somewhat pessimistic on, I think it was a little more optimistic say a year ago, but pessimistic on right now, is that we should actually not um, 
try to focus on the dispensary side at the federal level, it's all got to be based on the financial side. It's all about the, the flow of money and capital and investment and not mess with actually the dispensary side, not mess with the, um, uh, the, 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 you know, the growing side, not mess with any of that. It's actually about how do you handle where and who gets money and gets invested in uh, that I think is going to be vitally important. And to go to, to sort of finish this off again, I think oftentimes when we think about legalization, we sort of face it, it was in sort of the liquor side, the prohibition, ending the prohibition of liquor. Uh, and I think in this instance, what we're really sort of talking about is actually looking at how we handled housing um, and what what turns out to be the key in housing isn't the location in which the house is. It's it's in how you use money and laws to pack people in and sort of concentrate poverty and deserts. And I think that that truly comes from that financial side. So to me, I think this is the biggest challenge we're going to have, is that we're going to constantly be in an uphill battle to improve uh, Black and Latinx uh, participation within cannabis. Uh, and I think that until we can actually have changes on the sort of financial sector side, um, it's going to just be always a tough, tough fight. Um, you know, and I think there's, there's things that we can do that will help. You know, I think this is stuff down the road. Again, I think this is constantly evolving. Uh, I'm still a big supporter of the idea that if you have a coffee shop, um, that you should be able to have to be able to sell cannabis and then get on site. I think equitably speaking, being able to diversify um, your business options, I think is very important, particularly depending on the community you're in. Um, and um, I just think that, but I think those are all things that we're, we're just going to constantly have battles over for the next decade. And I do urge that folks in the federal government get their act together, particularly on the financial side of things, because I think that will be hugely important. I love the points you just made, Robert. Like, we're not going to fix it all in one industry. First of all, I think that, that that's a mistake to think that we can undo all of the harms of the war on drugs in this one industry. Um, and, and you're absolutely right about the, the access to capital piece. And one of the things I, was always, I, I really struggled with through the whole process was, um, you know, we, we intentionally chose to, chose to do a limited license market so the license would have value. Right. But then we had people coming back and saying, well, people who get a license because they're social equity applicants shouldn't be allowed to sell it because then it's just going to end up being an all white owned industry. And like, no, the, the, the whole point is for this to be an item of value. This, the whole point is to give that leverage to bring in capital because you have that have this item of value. And frankly, that opportunity to build generational wealth by selling that asset. And, and so it's, it's such a complex puzzle. And I, I talk about all the time, you know, when you're doing something complex, it's like a jello mold, you know, you poke it on the left side, it wiggles on the right. And we have to always be mindful of that. And, and you know, your point about the, the flow of capital and how do we impact the flow of capital, that remains a tough nut to crack. Um, you know, it, it, it's, this is an incremental process. And, you know, those of us who are here to undo the harms, know that and know that we have to keep going that, that there's no magic bullet and this is yeah. certainly not the magic bullet yeah and i'll just end i, I think i want to go back to the housing piece i think what moving out of the uh prohibition period is something that's is similar to alcohol and, and liquor that's fine but what we've now entered into is something very similar to the housing sort of um battles of the mid 20th century, uh, to be very honest with you. I think the 1940s to 1970s period of housing, particularly on how, um, how that impacted black working class families, especially, I think is really sort of uh, what hits me here. And I think that what we need to do is take the lessons that we learned from that, the housing fight that we had and not repeat them when it comes to cannabis. And it's it, it just, People might not see that directly, right? They, they look at cannabis and you think, okay, well, it's got to be like, it's got to be like tech, right? Um, you know, but it, it, it's actually, tech doesn't have nearly as many restrictive laws that we've saw, we've seen when it comes to drugs. Housing, though, did in fact have systemic restrictive laws, and there were many solutions that were put into place that ended up being detrimental. They looked good in the short term, but they long term had a lot of problems. And so when we think about this, we have to think about we're now in a period very similar to um, the, the sort of housing battles. You know, again, you know, how, where people are placed, uh, the generational wealth piece 
uh, the investment piece. I mean, w- what we know is, you know, the joke is always like Canadian VCs are going to, you know, love what's happening in Illinois. And what do you do to undo that? That's a lot of things have to particularly happen at the federal level. But I think our job over the short term is to try to just sort of fix at the edges, but not know that and not bank that we're actually going to be able to completely get this solved. And the other part is to really, and I, I emphasize this to a lot of people, we had a huge town hall. I love how we're talking so deeply about this. I, I'm taking up so much time to talk about this. I'm sure there's a lot of topics we have to get into, but we have this huge town hall um, in South Shore uh, in 2019. Um, and everybody wanted, you know, it was, uh, it was like 120 people in a room in South Shore. They wanted, all they want to do is talk about the dispensary. And I, you know, I told them the story about a very successful, rich, historically rich family. I'm not going to name them, but I always say that they made their money in the fact that they were the only people who were able to move, uh, move, um, move goods and, and, and from point A to point B after the great Chicago fire. They weren't, they weren't selling the goods. They were able to move the goods and simply being able to be involved in some other parts of uh, this opening of the economy it, it is important, but they were told and everyone was told, this is your chance to make it rich. And I always say like, sometimes what's as important for wealth isn't the ownership of the dispensary, but how much money you, you, you make in the job that you have. And if that job is designed to make sure that you A, have it, you keep it and that you're able to, uh, you know, get a home or be able to buy a home or be able to buy something good to, you know, sort of expand to a larger and, you know, sort of aggregate demand part of the economy. And I think when you open up cannabis like that, uh, there's actually a whole host of opportunities. And if we're not looking at that, someone's going to jump in and take advantage of it. And uh, that's just my sort of bigger concern. Yeah, we had, we had some conversation, but not as much as I wished about tangential industries, right? There was so much focus on the licenses and the value of the licenses and what it would mean to have a license when, you know, we also featured, you know, an accountant who had been an agricultural focused guy who is, who is now, you know, has most of the, the cannabis industry as his clients and his business has grown tenfold from, you know, being the, the accountant to the farmers to being the accountant to the cannabis industry. The, there was a, a, a soda fountain company downstate that provides all the CO2 to most of the growers. Like there's so much opportunity and I want us to spend a little bit more time on that. I would love to see more of that. Okay, you know, before we turn to energy, let me just mention what, what I'm kind of thrilled individually about the two of you right now uh, from the vantage point of like in a 50 years in this uh, political game. Um, look at how everything we talk about, particularly this issue, your focus on equity, okay? We, we know that's happening uh, and part of it maybe having to do with all the uh, criminal justice and the, the shootings and so forth uh, and the pandemic, but it's really heartening uh, to see our legislators trying to look at every aspect of legislation uh, with the equity issue. Because as, as Robert said, and uh, I think what, if, if people didn't quite pick that up, um, we now of course know about how important is accumulating wealth. And uh, when they th- think about all this discrimination in the past, particularly here in Chicago and restrictive covenants and things related to housing, um, basically got a whole generation of people, in this case, mostly black, who never had the opportunity to do like a lot of us you know, I was 25 and I was able to buy this cheap condo and then the condo was worth more. Enough. And they would deny that opportunity. And for most of us, unless you're really rich, your wealth is in the home or a condo or whatever that you own. Uh, so it's really heartwarming to see that. Now, uh, let me turn to energy. OK, and on the energy issue about, you know, what's what is going to happen as much as you know, remember, I don't think most people understand what's going on. OK, so tell us a little bit more about the clean energy bill and what do you think about it and what's going to happen? I, I will take lead on this. Um, so um, I, since FIJA, um, I, which I, I try to explain Fiji is going to be like its own thing. So let's not go down that path. Okay. Um, the best way to put this is there are a variety of different gaps when it comes to energy policy that a variety of different stakeholders want to fill. And they have many competing interests 
that contradict each other. And um, it, the best way to describe it is uh, it, it's a headache for everybody, whether they want to admit it or not. Um, so you have clean energy folks who uh, they, they might be involved in solar and wind, or they might just believe it in an ideological sense. Uh, you have coal uh, that is, in all honesty, just begging. Uh, they're, they're in the la they're, they're trying to hold on for dear life um, as a viable energy source that, um, and they want to be protected as much as possible, particularly downstate. You have, uh, we're going to get into Exelon and Comet in a second, which has another different thing at stake. But you have nuke, nuclear nukes that Exelon has that, um, that you can really tie to bad management, uh, but need a, a couple of them need a, a, a form of a bailout. And then you have the political dynamics of ComEd having a dirty, nasty lobbyist um, who, uh, or former lobbyist, I don't think he's a lobbyist anymore. Um, and so you have these, and then you have this sort of youth led climate justice fight that has fundamentally changed the way I think a lot of people, particularly myself, um, have seen the climate fight tied to racial justice and economic justice fight. So that led us to this sort of creation of this bill process around the energy bill, um, where um, the climate justice space wants to see decarbonization, particularly around, I believe 2035 is the, a, a really key date here. Uh, so 2030 and 2035. Uh, decarbonization will most likely impact coal. So coal hates the decarbonization piece. Then you have um, Exelon who has nukes. I don't, Kelly, you, you jumping into this? I'm trying, my, my mute is trap challenge, but keep going and I'll jump in. Okay. Um, so, and then you have, you know, Exelon that, you know, there is a, a couple of nukes who need support, but they don't, they're not politically the most, uh, nobody wants to really dive in with them. But at the end of the day, what we do have is a unique opportunity. We can, um, we need to um, stop decarbonize by 2035. Um, we're able, we're going to be able to fund uh, in terms of equity, uh, the equity, the, the solar and clean energy sector will have far more equity and investment, particularly around Black and Latinx workforce uh, development. Um, and we could, even though it won't be perfect, uh, the energy bill, it can be historic. Uh, now, the only problem is, are the people involved in this, particularly with coal, and I think Exelon, if, if they can maybe get out of their own way, they can play an important part in this history. Uh, and I'll, I'll finish this as we're, you know, we're, this is a very hard and large thing to try to explain. Uh, the hope is by next Tuesday, when we go back down in the Senate and next Wednesday, I think in the House, that we have a, an agreed bill um, that doesn't have exemptions for the people who are destroying this planet. Uh, I, my favorite thing to say to people is um, to put them on the spot, particularly if they're with coal or in the energy space, is if they have grandchildren. And I ask them, what, what do they think about putting their grandchildren in a planet they're destroying? And let them answer it because they can answer it to me. I don't need to do that answering for them. And it is almost always a horribly shocked answer of, I can't believe, you know, one person I won't name literally said to me, do you think climate change is real? And that's when I said, that's all I need to know about how serious you are about this policy. Um, but it, hopefully the, these sort of different stakeholders don't get in their way uh, and we can get an energy bill done, uh, particularly with really historic levels of clean energy investment and decarbonization. And th that's a great summation. Uh, you know, the, these bills have been, even CJA, have always been really challenging for me because I, I have a fundamental problem providing funding to a profitable corporation. Um, and Exelon's behavior this session was akin to, you know, a group of teenagers who were caught having a rager in their parents' basement on, you know, last week 
having another party this week. You know, they were, they just kept doubling down on their dirtiness. And, and, and it, 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 it speaks a lot to why I've never uh, voted to support, to provide a bailout to a profitable company. You know, at the same time, like I have, I have a great deal of empathy for my colleagues who represent the districts where those jobs could be lost. Um, you know, I, I hear a lot from folks in my district who want us to move away from nuclear energy, but I also hear from the districts where those plants are as well. Um, it's an incredibly complex uh, situation um, made more so by the bad actors who, who refuse to acknowledge their bad actions, um, you know, and, and ultimately would like their bad actions to be financed by our constituents. Um, so it, it, is, it is complicated. Uh, and, and I do hope we end up with an agreed bill. You know, I, 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 the news today was that coal raised its head again um, to, to try to get exempted. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see where it all lands, where it all shakes out. You know, the, the, we joke in Springfield that, you know, days are like dog years. And, you know, so between now and Tuesday uh, or Wednesday, in the case of the House, you know, a lot can happen. And I, I can imagine, quite frankly, that we're going to see way more roller coaster hills. And our challenge as legislators is to not get on the roller coaster, um, watch it and let it work its way out um, and, and let the negotiators do their thing. Um, I believe that, you know, Ann Williams, the House sponsor, has all the best uh, interests at heart looking for that truly historic bill that's going to, you know, make our planet better for our grandchildren, whether, uh, you know, even the grandchildren of the people who don't believe in climate change. Um, but uh, it, it is, it's one of the more complex things that we work on. Okay, and, and we'll all be watching that coming up. Um, Let's jump over because we're trying to keep a close eye on the time. Uh, Jane um, Balanchi, I hope I'm Balanchi. I don't know if I'm mispronouncing your name, Jane. Uh, Jane says um, uh, she was disappointed by the ethics bill and is wondering what can maybe done to strengthen things in the future. Um, this is always a hot one for legislators. Um, thoughts about that? Uh, the bill. Um, most of the reform groups were pretty critical of, uh, um, of the bill and mostly, not that there weren't some things in there, but given the level of frustration, the kind of indictments and convictions and apparently ongoing things, and we can expect more, uh, that it was, um, uh, we didn't really get off the back burners, kind of the argument. So what do you think? Well, I would, I would start with all of the things that are alleged in the indictments are already illegal people act with impunity. Um, and, and, and so, you know, that's, that's the big challenge, right? Like we can legislate a lot of things, but we can't legislate that people obey the law. Um, but, you know, as we worked our way through um, working groups and caucus meetings, you know, I, I continually said our history is to do the least we can do. And we lived up to that. We did the least we could do. Um, and, and, and will continue to, to work and push. And those of us who work on the reform side will continue to push for more. Um, but, you know, again, the stuff that, that has us embroiled as, you know, the scandal capital of the world was already illegal. They just didn't care. And that's really important to acknowledge. Um, you know, they, you, you can't make a law about you know, the speaker using his best friend to solicit bribes because we already have one. And so that's about, as real about, as it gets. What about this part though on, on that, Kelly? For example, um, uh, let's pick on my old friend, uh, Ed Burke, okay? Um, Please, let's do. <laughs> uh, some of the things, whether it's a question of legality, is that we have too often, uh, the issue of outside income can be a fair one for some because uh, um, state legislators are generally seen as part-time and they have a right to try and um, benefit themselves as, as well. But when you have the cases of um, the Burke or the people involved in the tax business um, mm -hmm. that basically, and like in Burke's case, chairman of the finance committee, and yet he represented not just Trump, but represented, uh, uh, United Airlines, I could go on and on and on. Um, and I think most of us would agree, even though it's not clear enough in most of the laws, that you have a fiduciary responsibility. 
So if you're trying to make a deal for American Airlines, United Airlines, or Trump, you're basically taking that out of the public's um, hand, so to speak. Yeah. So, um, uh, so in other words, there's lots more issues than just the fact that yes, no matter what we do, we do have the bad apples and they'll continue. Um, but you know, what else? What else about the law or, or, or Robert, either, either one that- um... and, and Robert, I don't know if you guys ran into this in your discussions of this in caucus, but like, you know, there were there were a lot of yes buts as we talked about things that, that we might wanna change, right? And, and, and just specific to the Burke question or the, the folks who represent tax buyers or, or tax appeal stuff, you know, like, attorneys under their code of ethics can't reveal a lot about their clients. And so on our side with our, our, our economic interest disclosures, you know, we had lots of conversations about forcing disclosure of that stuff, but attorneys really can't do that. And so you, you run into these places where, there, where there's just, you know, conflict that, yes, this sounds like a good idea, but that can't happen on that side. And, you know, to the, to the extent that this is a, you know, this is technically a part-time gig, but who in the universe is going to find an employer who's going to employ them six months out of the year when they're going to be gone six months out of the year. So it's a messy situation to start with. And every time you, it, um, my jello mold analogy applies in so many circumstances, but, you know, you're going to poke it on the left and on the right, you're going to run into conflicts on the other side. Um, and so th that does become challenging. And uh, Robert, I don't know the extent to which you guys got into that as well, but it, 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 it got really tough having some of these conversations. Yeah, I mean, I, it's so funny. I guess we're learning that I'm uh, optimistic on long-term, pessimistic on the short-term. My belief is that fundamentally, the question we're actually asking ourselves is how do we actually value government? Uh, how do we value people who work in government? How do we value our legislators? And if, if the idea that you are, you, you're, you're supposed to, get paid whatever the amount that we, you know, we get paid in our, you know, if you're not a committee chair, 60, high 60,000. Um, if people think that's okay, that's fine. Except if you live in a large chunk of the state, it's going to be, and if you want to have kids, it's going to be a complicated, difficult situation for you. I'm not here. Look, my belief is that we should actually really be investing the idea of making, being part of government and the state apparatus something that is, you know, worthy and respected. Um, but that's not for me to decide. That's the decision that voters have to make on when it comes to this. If they believe that they don't want to see any conflict of interest, well, then you have to say that you want to value the people who are supposed to work for you. And I think that's, that's the challenge that we're at. And I think um, anytime we came up to this question, I always felt it like, okay, I understand that we don't want conflict of interest, but because we undervalue working in government, whether that's being elected or not, we undervalue that so much. And, you know, I'm going to get all hyper critical and deep and say the word neoliberalism, but in a, in a period in which that happened, well, all you've done is now put people in this position where they're stuck to, um, maybe being faced with a conflict of interest and that conflict is actually, is their kid gonna go to college and are they gonna pay for it? That's the conflict of interest we're talking about here. And that's conflict of, and at the end of the day, that also means that you don't get regular working class people, particularly black folks in elected office because it, it act, it's very difficult. It's expensive to run for office. It's expensive to be in office. It's expensive to live uh, particularly in, in, in cities or in municipalities in the state, not just Chicago. And I, I think that that's the challenge that we're facing. And to me, I, 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 I've used as an organizer, I'm used to living, uh, you know, sort of getting paid twenty six, thirty thousand dollars a year. That's something I'm used to. That's a decision, I, you know, I, I make all the time. Sometimes I'm like, oh God, I can't believe I'm doing this. Maybe I should go get a law degree. And then I tell myself, I don't want to ever get a law degree. But um, it's so. That to me is like, okay, well, I'm used to that. That's something I've made a decision on. But now that I'm, uh, by the way, is there a light shining through? Am I trying to get through? Okay. So I'm about to get married um, next year, late, uh, mid next year. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, 30 year old me has different conversations than 36 year old me uh, where I start thinking about, okay, 
getting married. That's expensive. It's a, it, they mark up everything that involves wedding. I mean, I, I, I told my fiance, I was like, well, what we should do is we should just get married and then call it a party to avoid a markup on that. Um, we want to really lay down roots, you know, be able to get a home. Well, that's super expensive. And the market isn't easiest. We have low interest rates, but high home costs. What an amazing combination. So we have that going on. And then we started having discussions about kids. And it really hit me like that's, those are all expensive things. And I am at a level of privilege more so than most people where I can afford parts of this, maybe not all of it. And do we want to be able to say that people who are regular folks living their life can be part of our government or not? And we need to fundamentally change how we value that because the greatest conflict of interest that I see isn't necessarily someone working at a law firm and working in government. It's whether someone's able to send their kid to college, whether someone feels like they can pay their rent or their mortgage, and whether someone's able to feel like they can live their life. And if they can live their life in dignity, they're going to be able to actually give more dignity to the people they represent. Let me just say that, because um, I want to keep us moving, that um, um, I don't know, kind of a horse in the cart here, okay? Uh, if anyone doesn't fully understand what Robert is saying, a little bit Kelly too, is that I mean, we use the word value. Basically, if commi commissioners and our state legislators, the aldermen are doing a little better here in Chicago, but if, if they're not getting paid, which you might say a significant salary, uh, they're gonna be looking for other work too. Um, so let, let's say that's a real factor. I should really talk to county commissioners as well, um, but it would, we'd be in a much better state as, uh, as a society and a state, if in fact, um, while we wrestle with these difficult issues, that we did everything possible to have as much honest information, okay? Because if you choose to be in public office, you're in public. And so let's say that there, we don't have the strictest lobbying laws, et cetera, um, but outside income and those kinds of, should really be much more clear the statement of economic interest, all sorts of things, the more I might suggest the legislature can do to say, hey, okay, we, we're we trying to set a standard because you all, the good guys, in many cases, you're stuck with the bad standards that the others abuse the system will. And they're not, they're not just because of their, you don't make that much money as a state rep or state senator, they're just crooks, okay? Mm -hmm. As Kelly said, they're breaking all anyway. So, um, but let me just say a final thing on that is that the good news, at least for me, um, I like the fact that um, the legislature was changed, at least in the sense that we allowed Chicago not to be preempted. Now, mm -hmm. preemption means um, that, um, you know, it's my interpretation is that Chicago has stronger laws, okay, on some of these issues. And if they weren't um, pre, uh, if they were preempted, then those would be wiped out. And I know there was an attempt to do that by some, and I'm glad at least that didn't happen at least because uh, um, I know there's a lot of concern about the small rural areas, but for me, the real kicker is, is the heart of the, and I'm not saying there's not problems elsewhere, but Chicago and Cook County are pretty much a, a big part of, of where a lot of this stuff happens and is encouraged. Um, anyway, any other I agree, David, we definitely like the, the, the preemption argument was was frustrating because, yes, there does need to be alignment in definitions and things like that. But that doesn't mean that we're right and they're wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, to the outside income thing, I, I vividly remember when Mike Quigley got elected to Congress. He lived in a house near Wrigley Field and his block had a, a practice of renting out their garages. Uh, for parking. It was, you know, like they all did it. They charged for their garages. And as a member of Congress, he couldn't participate in that. Like it, 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 their, their rules are such that he couldn't even rent out his garage for Cubs games. And that kind of stuff, we haven't even begun to contemplate. Um, like when you go to Congress, that's your income, period. Um, and, and, and that's a big difference. Pretty nice income. Yeah, it isn't a bad income. Um, and, you know, whatever cash you might have gotten from your garage, I think you're okay. <laughs> I think, I, I, again, would feel much better. Uh, let's say you paid commissioners more or state legislature more. But, of course, part of that would be nice. Uh, we certainly don't need 50 aldermen, and God knows if we need that many legislators. Um, I like the L.A. model. I think it's in their county where they have 15 people, but they're very talented, and they both are executives and 
legislators. But anyway, uh, go ahead, Robert. They make $250,000 a year, yes, I think, too. Do. But yeah. that's a different conversation. But uh, I'm going to move to LA. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, please don't. <laughs> I was going to say, David, I was just going to add that I, I agree. I think the transparency part is the fact that because we don't have the transparency there, that if you're a bad faith actor, you can use the argument of, oh, well, I got to pay for my such and such thing. And that's where it's like, well, OK, well, what does that actually look like? And that's the key to the transparency argument. And, you know, again, I repeat, I'm like, I'm such an open book. I'm sure it's like not the most politically healthy thing to do, but um, I, I do think like the transparency part has to be out there and upfront. Uh, but the same thing is the transparency needs to be like, we, we need to have a fundamental discussion about the, the value of government. And again, it's not just the elected. Like, I, I want to make that very clear. This is, this goes across, you know, staff levels and everything along those lines that some, you know, you, you see these stories, these sort of right-wing stories about like a small town mayor and, um, you know, their pension. And it's really just a scare tactic because that's not actually speaking to the broader issues in terms of government. It's just an old right-wing thing to be like, can you believe it? Um, and it makes everybody scared and riled up, but it doesn't actually help clean up government. It's often coming from people who are politically not the uh, clean, cleanly, clean, clean, cleanest politically. So I, I think that is, um, I, 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 to me, that's, this is, again, one of those things where there's just so much in terms of contradictions, in terms of ethics and government and the value of government. But I agree, bad, the, the thing about it is that someone takes advantage of acting in bad faith, uh, they, they actually just ruin it for the rest of us who are trying to do good stuff in terms of representing our constituents to represent the district. Okay, let me, um, uh, let me say something that's not a question. Uh, many of you have been asking about kind of the fair map or district, et cetera. Uh, as you may know, um, uh, certain Republicans have actually sued, um, sued the Democrats on that bill. Uh, so I'm not going to ask them a question about it for the obvious reasons. Uh, uh, there, so only certain people can discuss that legally. Uh, I will say this, because I mean, I like this to talk about kind of the real world of politics. So two quick things. Uh, to the extent that I understand that, I mean, everyone in theory believes in fair maps, um, but often the people that really look at most carefully, what they're concerned about is fair, uh, fair for many years did not mean blacks and Latinos being in office. So that's a crucial thing for many people. Um, and what the legislature was faced with, right, is that if they didn't act when they did, okay, if they didn't act when they did, there would be a vote of the commission. And of course, there's four Republicans and four Democrats. And of course, they would disagree, which is the Republicans goal. And then they flip a coin. OK, and so the real question would be is, should the Democrats that have uh, far more supporters in Illinois than the Republicans, should they take a chance to let the Republicans by a flip of the coin rather than any, quote, justice thing, draw the map? Anyway, so that I just think people need to know that um, people that are very concerned with maps. Also, because I think um, President Obama's comments have been taken out of context, he always emphasizes it's really important that we look at the federal redistricting. It's very hard for me, and there's friends of mine that really they all want fair maps, but it's hard for me to ask you all, okay, to do something like that when you see states where the Democrats have more voters in the state, and yet the Republicans uh, control the state legislatures. Um, and yet that, at the federal level, um, if that's not being dealt with, uh, how sacrificial lamb do you want Illinois to be? So I just wanted to mention that for, for our, our friends who um, I'm not going to ask that question. Um, uh, I'm, I'm watching the clock. Let me ask you this um, kind of before we get out of here. Uh, is there anything you want to mention? We didn't get to some of your criminal justice, Robert. What do you think were some really good things or some bad things? Um, you know, just, just one or two. Uh, and particularly, you did a lot, uh, Robert, in the criminal justice. So tell us about some of that. Well, I, I should point out that was Kelly did a lot on a thing that I, um, I, I, I played my role to get done. But um, I, I mean, it's a cool if I shout out. I want to particularly shout out Sessa, uh, which is the mental health first responders, because um, a lot of stuff has been getting a lot of media attention. But I don't think people are the history. I think it's the first in the country to do mental health first responders. And um, I think uh, 
and you know, you hear about this all the time. Oh, you know, mental health first responders treatments, not trauma is a thing that a lot of people have been doing in the city. Uh, and Illinois will be the first state in the country to have uh, a mental health first responder uh, system or mandating a mental health first responder system. And a large part of that getting done is Kelly just, excuse my language, kicking ass in the house. Uh, and every time Kelly uh, does, again, excuse my language, kick ass, it, it's a challenge for me in the Senate to make sure <laughs> that I hold my end of, of the bargain, hold up my end of the bargain. So uh, Robert and I do a lot of one two punches together. So um, we, we've done We've done several bills together. We continue to you're my go to guy. I feel like I'm your go to girl. Um, but yeah, it, it, that was that was a it, it, I love how under noticed it is, honestly. Yeah. Um, it's pretty cool, though. Okay, well, well but uh, back to that question a little bit um, in anything that you thought was particularly significant because, you know, legislators always get their butts kicked, as you know, no matter what they do, uh, significant and or uh, things that you were pretty disappointed it didn't happen. I mean, I will say uh, parental, parental notification, PNA, uh, not getting done um, was pretty disappointing. I think that was, um, you know, the idea that um, people, the very idea of trapping a young person into this position when it comes to abortion is, um, it's just, it's, yeah, it's, it's horrible and it's disgusting. And um, there's so much sort of parochial paternalism that exists. Um, and, you know, the idea of looking out for that, you know, that young woman I've got to make sure to look out for. It's just, it's not actually helping. It doesn't help anybody. So uh, I, not getting PNA done is something that's a disappointment. And I, I hope that we'll be able to get that done um, sometime uh, before the next session, but, you know. And Robert, as, as someone who, when I was working at now, that was a personal loss um, that that bill happened um, while I, while I worked for now. Um, I, I take that very personally too. And it's one that we do need to, to take care of. You know, we say you can't legislate good parenting. Um, as a 16 year old runaway, I'm really lucky I didn't get pregnant, um, you know, I, I, because I would have been screwed in Florida. Um, so yeah, that, that, was, that was a big one. But, you know, at the same time, we lifted the prohibition on judges waiving vehicle uh, code violation fees. Um, which is huge, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, it landed on my desk. I wasn't really sure how we were gonna pull it off and we did. And so now judges can make that determination. And Tell frankly, the idea- more. Tell us a little bit we, more how that helps people. Yeah, so, so we, we've been doing work around fees and fines and we created an opportunity to use community service hours to make up for those fees and fines, but we were we were valuing those hours at four dollars an hour statewide. Um, so the bill that that we pass um, actually raises that to, the, to at least the minimum wage, which grants judges the opportunity to go even further. Um, and I see a, a, a judicial hopeful there uh, on screen who I know is going to going to value humans' time. Um, and, and but, <laughs> But we also removed the prohibition on doing that for violations of the vehicle code. And that was something that had been compromised away in an earlier version. And there was huge backlash to doing. Um, but you know, just because someone has a moving violation or a DUI doesn't mean that they you know, are, are any less poor at the end of the day. Um, and so lifting that, that, that prohibition, and it's, it's a Cook County pilot program, but I believe that when we come to the end of this process, we're going to prove that it actually doesn't take it, you know, cause a hit. It's all about, you know, counties and cities and the state, frankly, balancing their budget on the backs of the poor. You, we should not be budgeting based on punitive fines. We should be providing the services that are required, including operating our court systems, without counting on pulling blood out of a turnip. And and this is a huge first step towards that. So that was a big, wonderful surprise. I didn't come into this session planning to pull that one off, but we did. Um, so there, there were some good surprises too. And that's a really good one because uh, again, there's a, and we earlier talked about how 
that people pay more attention to equity. Um, if you're really concerned about the little guy, okay, this is what you're talking about here. Um, governments are always seeking money, and I'm not to say bad bureaucracies, but they're always raising this fee and that fee and so forth. And you know, if you got a lot of money, that's not such a big deal, okay? But when you don't, um, and all of a sudden they're impounding your car or there's these legal fees or whatever, that's really difficult. So I'm really glad that uh, you're looking at that. But I still have a bone to pick before we're finished. And that bone is- You always do, dear. <laughs> I have several, but I'm being nice. Um, no, I, so why didn't um, Assessor uh, Fritz Kage's, in my mind, important bill passed? Um, he has been reforming the assessor's office from the scandals there and trying to make sure that particularly at the commercial level, we have accurate information as to what things are worth. And we have all these cases that we hear about all the time in the press where a big company X, okay, um, tells SEC for some legal reason that they bought the property, they the property's worth $100 million. But then when it comes to debating with the assessors off the board of review, oh, it's only worth 60 million. And all the assessor, if I understand, is asking is they provide some basic information that most other states do. And yet um, that didn't pass uh, last year, and in my best of analogy, it didn't pass this year. Um, is this just because the Barrios and the Barrios backers are still too strong in Springfield? <laughs> I love that we just literally look at each other and like, you, I was just like, whoever wants to go first on that one, that would be great. You, Kelly, I, I really think... think I'll, I'll you're time, you know, so you're bring it, baby, bring it. It's fine. Um, you know, I think that um, there are a lot of pieces, including a lot of what we already touched on, on the ethics conversation. Um, you know, what constitutes a conflict of interest remains an open question in our building. Um, but also, you know, the truth of it is the attention span for complex issues isn't always broad enough for folks to truly understand um, you know, I've carried a couple of property tax bills over the years. And like when you start to talk and Robert and I are both super nerds and we get deep in the weeds of the policy. And so we can be very conversant in, you know, what it means and what, what the impact of something's going to be. And, you know, some of our colleagues, when we come to them with these more obscure issues, like the curtains go down and they really need to understand exactly what you're saying. Also that that particular circumstance you're talking about also seems like a, a, a case of maybe a lie to the F, FEC right? or the SEC, right? Like, can we get them that way too? And, and we, we probably should look at both, both ends of that equation. Um, and I was talking to Fritz yesterday about this exact case. Um, it, but it, it's, it, the beauty of a citizen legislature is that we all know a lot about a lot of different things. The challenge of a citizen legislature is that sometimes things are so complex, it's really hard to find an audience for them. Fair enough. Um, well, hopefully um, I'll be one of those supporting Fritz's attempt next time. Um, okay, now we're just about out of time. Is there any last comments uh, from either one of you? I, I just want to say thanks. Um, this is a great conversation. Um, I think that all of you gave me way too much time to rant. Uh, and so I just want to say thank you so much for that. Uh, it, I, I'm glad everyone got to hear me go off. I, I think I went off on cannabis for quite a long time. Uh, but I think this is great to be able to have that space and talk about what we're doing in Springfield. I, I, I will finish this. Let's see, I'm going to try this. I'm going to tell myself I'm going to actually stop talking. But um, I'll finish this and say that one of the larger challenges of being a legislator in Springfield but representing a district in Chicago is oftentimes people know what's happening at City Hall or what's happening in county government. Uh, and when it comes to us, we're, we're like a myth. We go down there, stuff happens, you find out about it May 31st, and then it's done. And so the more we're able to talk about what we've done and what we're doing, the better. Um, and for me, at the end of the day, what I care most about, and I said this earlier about transparency, is trying to remove the curtain, whether that curtain is real, you know, thick or thin, whatever it might be, so that the public um, can learn more about what we're doing. It's, it's something I, I, I always love to do, and I really appreciate it. And uh, just want to say thanks for having me, David. Good. 
Kelly, I can only ditto Robert with that. You know, he, he's absolutely right. And also, you know, I really love your sharing that parallel with housing law. Like that's, it's the kind of stuff that, you know, when we're down in Springfield and, you know, hanging out either, you know, when I cook or whatever we do, um, you know, having that opportunity to hear those thoughts is huge and, and makes a big difference. But yeah, having our constituents have that opportunity to see us have those riff sessions. Um, not only humanizes us because you're right most people don't know what we do um or what it means they um but, but also just broadening that audience being open to the questions um you know robert and i are two people that that do this all the time in terms of like you know i'm happy to sit with a group of constituents and play stump the dj i'll answer questions till they run out um and and i appreciate that opportunity to do that um, and I value those moments with my constituents and getting to hear what folks are wanting to know about because that shapes how we do our work. Um, so thank you for providing this forum, y'all. It's always fun. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll just jump in and say thank you so much to Senator Peters and Representative Cassidy. Um, please keep working in the legislature and please come back and tell us about everything that you're doing. Our, our doors are always open. And of course, uh, thank you to our moderator, David. Um, again, this virtual town hall will be available on our Facebook page, as well as on our website at www.goodgovernmentillinois.com. And once again, your support allows us to keep putting events like this one on. Show your support at www.goodgovernmentillinois.com. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.